Hiya, I'm Andy, I'm the horn player in Onyx Brass and the instrument itself, um, if you don't know, comes sort of as a sort of a hunting instrument. It was used for people generally on horseback, um, it would be called maybe the corps de chasse and it, basically it was used as an instrument to signal, you could be, it would be heard over long distances. Obviously, that's um, slightly different how um, we play today uh, in a brass quintet. And what would be really obvious to you there was the fact that this right hand here was not within the bell here. That's become something that has um, evolved over well over the centuries, but it we needed to have a little bit more culture when it became indoors. So it was. It, obviously thought an easy way to hold it would be with the hand in here but also it gives it a much more mellower sound so for example I'll play the, exactly the same thing now with the hand in the bell just to give you an idea of the difference the great thing about the French horn is it covers a, actually a, one of the largest ranges of, um, in the brass quintet a good range to use as a, as a composer would probably start for, for myself would be a very a low B flat, which in concert pitch, which I will come on to in a minute, is an E flat. But is it, for all intents and purposes, this is my B flat. And then we can then play another three B flats on top of that. So for the, for the solo range in the instrument, you maybe want to be thinking, um, let's say uh, the treble clef, you're going to be thinking of a G um, from around there. And then, so for example, here's a very simple melody that some composer called Tchaikovsky put together. which is a, is, a, is, a, is a lovely area of the instrument to work in. It sings, you can hear the, all the overtones. It's not, the instrument's not straining in the high or it's not low, where sometimes it gets a little bit sort of the, the projection of the instrument may be lost slightly. So if, if you were then to put the same melody lower down, you, you'll hear the difference. And while it's, that's only an octave lower, all of a sudden the, the character of the instrument has changed and it's, you can maybe see why it's maybe the solos aren't often used in that register. A good thing to talk um, about the French horn is how to notate for it. Something that I've already touched upon is that it's an instrument in F. Unlike the trombone and the tuba, those are pitched in concert pitch, whereas being an F, and the fact that it's a fifth lower, one must write the notes for the French horn player a fifth higher. So a middle C for myself will actually sound an F one fifth lower. So to counteract that fifth lower, one must write a fifth higher. So to give an example, your concert pitch C would would require myself to be playing a G, which would be. And that's a very important thing to remember when writing for the French horn. 
Also, a great thing to think of uh, when you're writing for the French horn, and I'm sure many of you will be writing on computer software, is when you've written, you've written your score uh, and your parts, it will come out if you just press transposing score. Quite often, the horn will then have a, have a key signature, will suddenly appear. Um, as a horn player, and I think most of my colleagues will probably agree, we actually prefer to work with no key signatures at all. I mean, again, it's a historical thing, because when you were an instrument in D, or an instrument in E flat, say in the Mozart or Haydn, when they wrote their symphonies, there was never any key signature. You just played the instrument that was in that key. So we're sort of used to not seeing a key signature. Sometimes it, if you've got accidentals all over the place, it might look a little bit more busy, but actually as a horn player, I would prefer to see it with, with all the accidentals written out. Um, so when you're setting up your score, it may be worth thinking of putting the horn in F, and then quite often, I can only speak of Spalius, because that's what I use, it will have brackets, no key. So actually, when you press that button for transposing score, it will then be an instrument still with no key signature, which is, again, for me, I prefer to see. If you were to write mute for the French horn, this would be what you would expect, or as a French horn player, I would expect to be using. Um, quite often with the other instruments, as especially trumpets um, and trombone, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, they have separate mutes, so quite, you would need the mute to be, it's more, you need to be more specific. You may, you may be talking Harman mutes, you may be talking straight mutes, you may be talking um, cup mutes, for example. We don't have those mutes. We would just have what would be called a mute. As it would be maybe a straight mute for a trombone, something similar. Um, obviously, into the bell. The mute itself is generally some form of fibre, or like this one, is wooden, and it will give a nice sort of mellow character to the sound. One thing that also is used sometimes which closely resembles the mute, um, is hand stopping on the French horn. Um, and that requires me, with my hand, to basically close off the air coming out of the bell. And I'll see, I'll see if I can give a good example for you. When I'm playing the French horn, it will be like this. It's, it will probably look on that camera that I'm not doing it. But there you are. You, you may hopefully can see the open part of the bell. So I'd be playing. And then, as a, I would stop the instrument, I would just pull my hand across, and it's literally trying to stop any air coming out of the bell. The beauty of uh, the, st the stopping sound is you can obviously hear that suddenly it gives this more maybe ethereal quality, also maybe slightly distant. Um, but one thing that it can do also is it can maybe add a little bit of spice, maybe should we say, to the note because it gives you a little bit more sort of uh, aggressive maybe quality if you used in certain in specific cases. <laughs> And when played loudly, you get this nice little fizz, which I suppose you could say is similar to maybe like a metal mute on, on a trumpet. Now, if you're going to use uh, uh, either of these um, qualities of the instrument, if you were going to use the mute itself, just writing consort muted, and instantly we would think of a mute like this. Um, and if you were to want a stopped 
uh, quality to, the, uh, to your music. Again, you can just write stopped, and we would know exactly what that would mean. But you can also, maybe say you might want, just want one note to have a certain, that certain stop quality, you can put a cross over the note, and then maybe the next note you would just put a circle. It's sort of, I think it's similar to most instruments, you can use that. But for us, if we saw a cross over a note, we would understand that that one note would be stopped. When writing um, for the horn in, its, in the stopped character, you maybe have to be slightly wary of writing too low for it because it actually becomes harder for the instrument to speak when you, you write too low. So, for example, this, is, this would be a written C, middle C, which works quite well, but when you start going lower than that, it gets a little bit more fuzzy and you start losing the character and also maybe the tuning. But one great thing that, that using a stopped character is that you can really allow the horn to creep around at quiet. You, you don't have the, that sizzly character, but it gets really quiet. And I think probably that would, within the, the, the five instruments, that would probably be the quietest you would be able to have an individual instrument. One uh, technique available to the French horn, um, and it's probably, you, you will hear it quite often in maybe film music, uh, or music written you know, for the screen, um, is what would call, we would call a gliss or a rip. Um, and it's a specific quality of the, of the horn that you can play so many notes within the harmonic series from, by just slurring through those uh, notes. So here, for example, this would be a rip for an octave one from uh, an A to an A. If you would like to notate uh, a rip, Quite often, if you just write gliss or the squiggly line between the two notes that you're, you're from the bottom to the top, we would generally leave it. So if you wrote two crotchets, say, for example, as I just played an A to an A, you wrote the A crotchet to an, the high A crotchet, we would leave it late. It wouldn't be a glissando through one beat, it would be a late gliss um, to then catch all the notes in between. 